uh, for our last final panelist. So ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let us enjoy, and uh, hopefully you guys ha can get a thing or two out of this. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, such a pleasure to uh, hold this, uh, host this panel for you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all of our panelists to start introduction about themselves first. Uh, I will start by myself. My name is Lindy Chen. I fly from Australia. I am the president of uh, Australian Blockchain Alliance, and also I'm the managing director of China Direct Sourcing. We specialize in helping business uh, importing and exporting from China. So, thank you very much. Now I uh, invite uh, Jamal. Would you like to give uh, the audience an introduction about you, yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jamil. I'm the CEO of uh, a company called Chain House. Uh, I came in. Uh, from New York City, we do a bunch of different things. Um, we are building a, a, a payment system for the enterprises uh, and a supply chain payment system uh, for agriculture. Uh, we do a lot of stuff in education. We do events in New York City. Last year, we held over 50 plus events. Um, I'm a professor at Columbia Business School, NYU and CUNY. I teach graduate level blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, and machine learning uh, on the business side and on the technical side. Uh, I'm currently writing a book on uh, quarter blockchain. Great, thank you very much. How about Branson? Can you introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all of you, uh, some familiar faces. Uh, usually by this time, I'm sure a lot of people have disappeared, but it's good that you guys stay. Um, so uh, let me just quickly introduce myself. I, I'm from the quote unquote, the sexier neighbor of Malaysia, which is Singapore. Um, myself, I actually run an exchange, digital asset exchange called ecxx.com. Uh, the other hat that I wear is actually, um, I'm on the executive committee for uh, Singapore FinTech Association. Um, we work very closely with the uh, Central Bank of Singapore, which is the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, and what we do is that we actually pull together the three parties, uh, the startups, uh, the financial institutions, and the regulators. So uh, we perform that role uh, 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 for the ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Brenzin. How about Sabrina? Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Sabrina Kim from Korea. Before I joined the blockchain industry, I used to work for the traditional finance company, uh, Morgan Stanley Capital International as an analyst. And now I'm CEO of Bluecon. Uh, our company is uh, developed a payment system development for for more than 10 years. And now we are adopting this program, this platform to traditional a traditional payment system to blockchain industry. So we are doing uh, widen the blockchain market for blockchain users, and we are issuing crypto debit cards and transportation cards for uh, crypto exchanges. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. And now let's invite uh, Charan to introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Charan. Good to see you all and good afternoon. Uh, I am the chief product architect of Finterra, and uh, at Finterra we work on Islamic social solutions, and uh, we create uh, social financing solutions for various banking partners, and uh, we also create various Islamic digital uh, blockchain products for uh, banks, what we work with. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So, um, Jamal, I want to ask you a few questions. Uh, I heard you mentioned you work actually for the uh, JP Morgan and the Bank of America before. And the one of very controversial uh, question, like uh, the topic was uh, previous two years, the JP Morgan has always already against uh, the issuing token or have a big criticism about them. But recently, they have issued a JP Morgan token. So what is your view on that? Um, so yeah, so we, we, we have a relationship with um, the, the uh, Quorum, the blockchain that JP Morgan has created called, is called Quorum. We have a relationship with that team. 
Um, there's a lot that I can't say that's kind of a little bit um, confidential, but um, I think um, some of the interesting aspects, I think it's a very interesting thing that JP Morgan is doing uh, with the coin. They, what they're trying to do is uh, preempt the entry of cryptocurrencies into their enterprise uh, by using the JP Morgan coin. What a lot of people don't know is that the coin doesn't exist at this time. At least um, the last time I spoke to them, that the coin is not in production. Um, it's more of a concept and, um, um, and it it exists maybe in development mode, but it doesn't exist in production. And uh, it's going to be used as a settlement uh, settlement token. Um, it's going to help uh, JP Morgan entrench uh, its network effect with its with its institutional clients. I think it's a great thing. It's it started off this um, race uh, for tokens. If you were in the U.S., you probably heard um, two weeks ago. Uh, that Walmart filed a patent uh, for a, a similar type of token, uh, kind of like a stable coin or similar to uh, Libra. Uh, I think so it's kind of JP Morgan has kind of ushered in this um, uh, new era of enterprise tokens. Thank you very much. I learned a new thing today. I always thought that the JP Morgan token is actually already circulating from the information they're actually sharing. And today I got the insight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Branson, you mentioned about uh, you sit on the Singapore FinTech uh, Association Executive Committee. Can you share with us how the Singapore government has regulated this space? Yeah, okay, so I get asked this question quite a fair bit. I, I don't claim to represent the, the regulator in Singapore, but um, because we work very closely with them. Uh, so from what I understand is that um, the mantra that, that uh, the Singapore regulator has come up with is actually um, they want to allow um, the technology to run aside uh, the regulations, right? So they try not to regulate it uh, too soon um, so that you know innovation can can happen, so that I think that's that's the first thing that uh, the regulator has, has spoken about. So basically, regulations will run alongside uh, technology and not you know ahead of technology. So I think that's that's a great way to start. Um, the other thing that uh, the Singapore government has been doing is actually uh, Project Ubin. I'm not sure how many of us know anything about Project Ubin, but essentially they have been um, trying to simulate the uh, E Singapore dollar on the blockchain, and I think we have gone through like four phases, uh, and then the second phase is actually um, involves uh, 11 financial institutions in Singapore, and then the third phase is actually with the Nasdaq in in the US. So I think we are the fourth phase. So I think uh, in terms of regulations, I think uh, Singapore has been very very um, at the forefront. Um, they know what's going on, so they have been you know uh, getting involved in some of these projects. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina, you mentioned about uh, um, you guys run a very special uh, payment program. Yeah. So from your point of view, what do you think would be one of the core benefit of the blockchain in the uh, fintech and the banking industry? Okay, while we are working on the payment system developing, uh, we were thinking, we are considering how our platform, our technology can help blockchain industry because blockchain, in, blockchain industry has very limited market still. But um, if our platform is adapted to the market, maybe we, we think maybe the blockchain industry can be widened a lot. So uh, there are lots of projects for about the payments but still, there is no one can totally replace the existing financial system because the main um, mainstream in the market is still using um, credit card or debit card, or, or in China, it's a mobile pay is most uh, popular. So the mainstream is very hard to change, to, to accept a new way for people. So if we, we thought if we can adapt our platform, can be connected from between the traditional payment system to the blockchain system, maybe they can, uh, the both industry can be, um, can, uh, can provide a convenience for people. So uh, we developed a platform can be used for the for for banking. So the bank can be used uh, the what, what is it say the international transfer commitment 
Remit remittance, yes, remittance is, um, it takes uh, one or two days, right? Uh, and uh, the cost is much higher. So if, after we connect to this system adapted with our platform, it only takes a few minutes or 10 minutes. The time is very shortened and the cost became made much less. Uh, we are working both the developing countries bank and the developed countries bank. There are big difference between uh, for the speed and the cost. So uh, now what we are doing is for the developing countries bank is uh, they need much, much more timing than Korea. So when we transfer the money between the Korea's bank, it only takes a few seconds. It's very fast. But for the developing countries, they need more time because of the manpower problem. So uh, they are more aggressive to work with us to, to make the timing short, uh, the shorten the time and the cost. So I think the blockchain industry can make for the international transfer and the speed, they will uh, help a lot for the banking system. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sabrina. So, um, Shafran, you mentioned uh, you mentioned about you doing something in the social impact and also about the cross-border payment system. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? All right, so uh, on the first uh, part, basically our whole company is built on the tenant that uh, we provide uh, Islamic social financing solutions. So uh, when I say social financing, what really it means is there was an initiative uh, from World Bank called value-based intermediation. So basically uh, what that really means is that we create financial instruments which bring up the society while giving the profit to the people who invest into that financial instruments. So we are in this niche space where we create um, new financial uh, products or we instrument new financial products which are Sharia compliant and go with the social financing uh, products which are available widely at this moment uh, in most of the Islamic countries. And um, most of our business so far has been in GCC countries and uh, uh, most of our products are on the blockchain. So we sit on most of the boards there who uh, decide on the various norms for the blockchain in GCC countries. Um, sorry, your second question was? I only asked the one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. So. All right. Thank you then. Thanks. No worries. Thank you very much. So uh, we, when we look at the uh, blockchain application in fintech, one we talk about the cross-border payments. Two we talk about the smart contract. The third we talk about the share trading. Another one is talk about the trade financing. So Jamel, you actually mentioned about uh, you have run. A uh, supply chain uh, blockchain and uh, dealt with some cross-border payment system. And uh, can you share a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So we did some work with the World Bank uh, on uh, supply chain for agriculture, uh, and that allowed us to spin a product out uh, that we call Grow Ledger, um, and that does um, uh, cross-border payments um, using uh, tokens. It's a complex problem. Um, I think, um, and Branson and I, uh, we were actually talking uh, earlier about this, uh, and I, we, we kind of agree that uh, cross-border payments with tokens is probably uh, one of the best use cases for blockchain. Um, uh, and uh, my view is that it's one of the best because it probably has the most global application and it has the potential to implicate, implica uh, sorry, the potential to impact um, a large number of parties and large number of countries, large number of governments. I think um, in 10 years from now, um, central banks, most central banks, if not all central banks, will be using blockchain um, and trading and settling um, uh, using uh, these enterprise, uh, these kind of private chain uh, tokens. Um, and then, but then we have to see what happens with Libra. If Libra comes into the picture and becomes a platform, then that potentially can alter things. It's entirely possible for you to run um, a blockchain system and then do cross-border payments using Libra. Um, so I think we're still in the very early stages, uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a dominant use case uh, in a world where a lot of dApps are dead. There are no real 
adapts. Uh, I don't use adapt in my daily life. Um, and I think uh, when the blockchain, uh, we look at it from this perspective, I think it's gonna be something that has significant traction. We as a company are pouring in uh, a lot of money into investing in um, in the space. We're working on projects in this space. Uh, we're building IP um, uh, in this space uh, um, and patents. And I feel like um, this is an area that I think will be um, ripe for adoption. Well, to you might want to get uh, Branson's opinion on this also. Yeah, of course. So just one second. So actually, one thing I talk about the cross cross border payment. One thing about in international uh, international trade in our industry, and this is one of the pain points. And quite often, you know, for my customer, they often have to pay the money, and for a long time, and it take them probably sometimes two to three weeks, and uh, for the money sent from Australia to China, and not only that, and and sometimes it can even lost, you know, you don't even know where the money is. So therefore, I do see use the blockchain to solve that uh, pain point in the international trade is definitely a plus. So, Brendan, you have some view on that particular part? Yeah, I think um, like like what Jamil said, I think it's, it's, it's a very good use case in terms of uh, uh, transfer of value uh, across the blockchain. Uh, but obviously, we know that uh, the the volatility of, of Bitcoin as as a store of value is 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 uh, tremendous. So it doesn't make sense for you to you know you 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 send a, a one Bitcoin over today it costs like I don't know ten thousand dollars and the next day is fifteen and and, and next week is five thousand you know kind of thing. So uh, until that that part uh, stabilizes, I don't think uh, it's meant for. Uh, you know, uh, major, major use case of, of uh, movement of value, uh, except for store of value, maybe. Uh, so so that, that part has to happen first, um, uh, sort of stabilize before you can actually even you know, think of using it for cross-border uh, remittance or cross-border transactions kind of things. Um, but having said that, so once that is done, now obviously, you know, uh, you need your regulations to catch up. And uh, then you know the adoption will, will will follow suit, but I think we are we are far far away from that uh, you know uh, as of today. Yeah. Great. So Sabrina, do you have uh, do you want to elaborate on that part cross border payment? Uh, yes, maybe my opinion is quite limited because my background is only for the si the payment system. But uh, why we are using credit cards is because it's a convenience, right? So I think the most uh, greatest impact to the blockchain, no, to, to people from using the blockchain system is will be the one of the convenience is the, the biggest point that I think. Um, it means because they can provide the, the speed and cost part, but still they cannot, the blockchain coin, crypto coins still cannot use in real life in real time. So it is, uh, it brings the people quite a convenient point. So when uh, uh, when we use the, when we issue the MasterCard, Visa card, that is quite usable to anywhere in the world. So that's why we are using the credit card, right? So if we hold the, the crypto coins, in my in our wallet, but if we, we cannot use it anywhere very uh, easily, then we are just holding. Then it cannot wide the, the market to everyone can accept. So, uh, so that's why we are using this kind of uh, cars to connect to the crypto. They can provide to people more convenient blockchain lifestyle. That's what we are doing. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Shebra? Um, I think uh, I have certain uh, uh, more in, uh, insight into this at this moment because we started a cross-border remittance exercise between um, uh, Oman, which is a GCC country, uh, with a certain uh, country in uh, Africa. So initially when we started this exercise, there were a few practical problems. First is the licensing problem these entities need to have to settle cross-border payments. Secondly, um, the fluctuating value in African regions is very high. So you cannot maintain uh, the same value for even a day. So it's so bad. So um, when we started off this exercise, first thing we realized is if 
there was a pre-existing remittance framework. Then it's very easy to implement blockchain. I absolutely agree with Jamal on that case that it's very beautiful to use blockchain or very good use case of a blockchain for cross-border remittance. It's very good as far as it is within the framework of an existing a remittance service. Like to give you an example, CIMB Bank in Malaysia implemented uh, cross-border remittance on blockchain six months back. So now people don't realize it, but what they only realize is you can send for eight, uh, to eight countries, you can send any amount of money with a fraction of the fee which we used to pay, pay before. That's all a uh, user realizes. But in the back end, the whole settlement is already changed. Um, with uh, new implementations for cross-border remittances, practical problems are quite heavy at this moment, including the fluctuating prices of the currencies, um, the licensing requirements, the country regulations, there's so many things. Uh, currently, uh, we are working with a team uh, of um, financial institutions based out of G GCC and African regions where we are coming up um, with a way or an IP to solve these problems. Uh, we are a group of about uh, 12 banks from both the regions and uh, uh, we as a technology partner, we are trying to provide a way in which we can provide a settlement uh, system without being affected with uh, most of the other problems what you're facing today. Okay, so. thank you very much. Yes, we have a, oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. So uh, one thing, you know, currently in the, there is a really a, a lot of buzzword about the Facebook and about the Libra, about the, you know, cross-border payments. So, you know, about this particular talk, like hot topic, and, you know, Facebook also, you know, went to uh, the Congress and for the hearing, and there is, What's you guys' view on, is it a good thing for Libra coming out, or is it a bad thing? What's the advantage, what's the disadvantage? Who would like to answer? Who would start? I'll start since I'm from the U.S. <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually was in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago at the U.S. Capitol talking about Libra to a bunch of Senate staffers. Uh, it was a private event, and then we actually did a public event at the U.S. Capitol on Libra, and it was. We got a ton of people coming there. It was very, uh, you know, people are very interested in it. Um, so I think uh, number one is like the there is. I don't think there's any significant regulatory challenges. There may be some, uh, but there's an enormous amount of political issues that. Uh, f um, and it's not Facebook. It's Facebook has one twenty seventh of of a say in it. It's a whole mess of companies. This is uh, it's a basically a consortium. Uh, so they're going to have to get through some of these headwinds, and if they can get through it, um, then there, there's significant technical challenges, right? If you read the white paper, um, and I spent uh, some time studying the white paper, if you look at every third or fourth paragraph in the white paper, the Libra white paper, it basically says it literally, uh, we still got to figure this out, right? And so, you know, that's the writers, the authors of, of the Libra white paper, even for example, how do you do storage on a node, they're like, how do you charge for storage on a node, right? Um, and which with the Ethereum thing that's already solved, they're like, well, we haven't figured out how to do that. So I think Libra is, they, announced, they said they'll be, they're about a year away, I think it might take a little longer, um, and so there's some time for that to occur. If Libra does roll out and it survives and it kind of comes out, I think it's a significant game changer. I think it will introduce cryptocurrencies to the masses. It will become a normal thing um, that you have a, a Calibra wallet and you can start trading, things like that. But at the same time, I think there's some dangers. There, um, if you look at the Walmart patent that they filed, specifically in the patent, they basically say the reason we want to have this coin uh, for our Walmart customers is because we want to track their uh, purchasing behavior. Right, so they want the data. They want data about your behavior, about individuals' behavior, and how money moves. And so I think with Libra, there is this exposure on the data side that we have to be careful for, and we all know Facebook doesn't have the greatest of records uh, when, it comes, uh, when, when it comes to privacy. So I think it's a mixed picture. Um, the regulators in the US still figuring out what blockchain is. They're still here, they're, not, they're catching up to what, what Libra means, um, and we're kind of helping them um, to some degree, um, and others are as well. 
uh, I think that uh, if we comes out in two years, it can potentially change how we do business. Well, one thing people also mentioned about uh, is uh, instead of looking at what, who is actually on that 27 organization, then have a look at who is actually not on that list. Who is actually not on the list? The bank and uh, also uh, many other organizations who is not on that list. And that tells something. What, what's your view on that, Brinson? Yeah, I just want to follow up on two points that uh, Jamal make. I think uh, basically two, two words, right? Number one is adoption, right? I think uh, Riley pointed out that uh, for the longest time, you know, when I, when I speak to some of my family members or even friends, talk about Bitcoin, you know, so they look at me like, oh my God, <laughs> that's a scam coin. Um, but you know what? Uh, even as recent as last week when uh, the People's Bank, of, uh, People's Bank of China, they announced that their they are sort of national cryptocurrency is almost ready. Uh, you know what? The same people that, I mean, my family members that, you know, for the longest time did not believe me, they start to asked me, oh, you know what, uh, perhaps things are getting mainstream. I said, yeah, for, for real. So I think that's, that's the main point, right? Because Libra itself, you need somebody with the cloud of Libra, uh, you know, to come in and, 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 and sort of, you know, tell everyone that, look, this is, this is possible, right? So I think for the longest time, nobody believed that. So and once Libra came around, uh, everyone started to believe. So that's number one. And the second thing uh, that Jamel uh, pointed out is privacy. I think that's a very, very important point because, um, I mean, we all put our personal data on the, on, on the internet without knowing you know, the repercussions of that. Uh, but going forward, uh, if we uh, associate a, a sort of a, a currency, a digital currency with our privacy, uh, and that's, that's a very high price to pay, I would say. So, so uh, you know, caveat emptor. Um, but coming back to your question on, on, on the organizations, I think, um, and this is related to data, right? So if you look at the organizations, um, you know, at the end of the day, what do they really want to get out of this, right? It's basically the user behavior, the data, um, you know, how do you purchase things, what do you do online, and things like that. So I think that's, that's the main part of it. Uh, you know, the consortia of, of participants. Um, of course, not, not forgetting the $10 million uh, entrance fee, yeah. <laughs> so, Sabrina, do you have any insight about how Facebook plays uh, on the Libra? No problem. How about you, Shabra? Uh, um, actually, uh, I think it all comes back to the basics of finances here. Um, we can treat Libra as a digital asset as far as it doesn't, in a way, con contest with existing currencies around in the world. Most of the jurisdictions, all constitutions, states that, and their laws, which states that you cannot create an alternative currency in a country. Only central bank has that authority to do so. So any currencies you create should fluctuate with your central bank currency, should not fluctuate independently of it. That is the basic law which exists as of today. And that's where most of the central banks have a problem with digital currencies and so forth. So Jamal's point is very real. Uh, if uh, Libra takes shape and moves in, uh, it is going to reach the masses. Now, how the data will be used, uh, the, I'll leave it to your speculation. And it's not new. Facebook has done it before. And um, in terms of uh, using uh, the Libra as a value, instead of actual currency, that will be a hill to climb for the whole consortium. And we are just hoping that um, they do it in a very right fashion, because uh, that means that so far we have just given data into a certain company's hand. And we will give whole country's economy at some point to a consortium, So, which um, most of the constitutions won't agree for. So we have to see how Libra is going to span out in that space. Thank you. Yeah, I just also want to add one more point is that if Libra does uh, roll out and go get into production and then there is a mass adoption, um, it can potentially kill other blockchains. It can kill off potentially Ethereum. Um, because now your question is, well, should I build an application on Libra and I can get 1,000 transactions per second, or should I build it on Ethereum and I maybe get 20 tra transactions per second? Um, um, and so now 
you as a builder of applications, um, yeah, you're giving up some decentralization, uh, but now you're at that crossroad, where, where, where are you gonna go? And there may be a shift towards um, building applications on, on Libra, which can impact other blockchains, even Bitcoin potentially. Definitely. One thing, uh, in my view, is uh, by uh, Facebook push out the Libra, it definitely caught a lot of uh, mainstream attention, and especially in blockchain world. And before, we only, you know, hiding our bubble, and it's only us in the, you know, the crypto society, in the blockchain society, and the community. But uh, with the news of uh, Facebook putting the Libra out there, and all of a sudden, all the social media, all the media, mainstream media, everyone start to pay attention to and I think you know definitely create the wider acceptance you know for the new technology for the cryptocurrency world as well so in summary you know the future trend is here when we talk about from the buzzword we usually talk about the a c d e now we talk about the a b c d e what is a ai b blockchain c what's c cloud computing what's d Big data, what's E? New, in, in, new energy. So, you know, consider that we have the adoption of blockchain in fintech and the banking, e wallet, e payment, and cross border payment like a remittance. And uh, today we finished for the day for the future trend of ABCDE. So, we have, do we have time for questions? Okay, we open the floor for the questions. Do we have any questions? <laughs> yeah, Gus have a question. Use that, use that. Which is a platform that our CEO has tirelessly built over the last two years. And this is a question for Samantha. Samantha, how do you see blockchain working in the normal banking system in mortgages? I think it's a, she, he refers to you, Sabrina. In, more, in a mortgage, in a mortgage. How does the uh, How does blockchain it? and also cryptocurrency work in the mortgage industry? Just说在在这个贷款的行业，如果说是运用了这个加密货币或者说是区块链的业务，那么在贷款的时候怎么样操作？ 我对贷款的部分是没有操作过的 She is not familiar about that part well, maybe, I'll, take that, I'll take the question I got an answer for you Good. Okay Okay. So uh, we're building a uh, blockchain for a mortgage, for a mortgage uh, 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 industry in the US um, So the mortgage industry in the US is heavy, heavily load, uh, like uh, burdens, uh, costs related to reconciliation Right, you're an appraiser, I'm a lender. The fact that you send me an appraisal report, my, my staff has to key that in again and over. The, the entire ecosystem has an enormous amount of overhead in terms of cost, right? And what the blockchain can do is bring partners together. So this is, we're talking about enterprise blockchain. What it can do is uh, bring partners together, standardize on a data model so that we, tr we trade and we exchange information on a cryptographically secure data model or insured data model, and that can bring our reconciliation costs down. So if I am putting a loan doc on, on a blockchain, you don't have to rekey that doc in, right? Uh, and that's one of the ways that blockchain is being used. Then later, we'll see, we see that now, but later we'll see in a couple years, new forms or mortgage instruments being issued on the blockchain because it's a lot, you can do it digitally now. I think it is from two sides as well. One is part, one part is from the business operation point of view. Another one is from asset point of view. From business, uh, like operational point of view, like Jamal said, you know, building with the blockchain can dramatically reduce the re repetition of the documentation and reduce the cost. From the business operation point of view, and the, you know, especially from the asset, uh, I you know, as long as it is regarded as a digital asset and uh, you know and also the recipients also accepted like a developer or like a seller accepted as the 20 percent deposit then I don't think a bank would refuse to loan as long as these uh, applicants have the right uh, uh, like uh, criteria and meeting the loan uh, like criteria and the bank will be able to issue them that thank you yes
in all sort of business, we always have the insurance to cover all sort of risks. My question to the panels, um, panelists is that, how is the indus in insurance industry response to the adaptions of fintech in your own business? Can you share some light in terms of their current policies, the type of the coverage, and the type of the premium you are currently paying? And how is that translate to the protection of consumer, like people on the floor? Thank you. Great question. Anyone who like to answer? Yeah, yeah so, so for, for a digital asset exchange, I think uh, uh, this is a major, major pain point for us uh, because, um, as you know, we are um, aiming to get a license from, from the central bank and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And one of the key points that, that uh, came up in our discussions is that, you know, how do you ensure consumer protection? Uh, and, and that's a valid, very valid question. And so um, in some of the cases that we have seen, and in fact, uh, we have a partnership with Ledger, which is the, the, the producer for co-wallets. Um, we have a, an agreement with them where a certain portion um, of the assets that are being placed with them is actually covered by insurance, right? Um, I can't remember the exact number, uh, but even then, uh, for the general insurance, I think uh, there are insurance companies out there uh, coming up with very innovative uh, products uh, that covers, um, you know, uh, digital assets, uh, um, whatever amount that you pla place with them, uh, there's a premium that they will place. Um, the exact premium is very interesting. Um, I would not be able to share the exact uh, amount, uh, but basically if you look at the, um, you know, I will sidetrack a little bit. Uh, if you talk about, uh, you know, the token called DAI, uh, the amount that you have to collateralize uh, to actually take out one DAI is actually 150%. So uh, if you take you know, some of the um, calculations from there, obviously the risk premium is pretty high, right? Because you, you, every other day you see exchanges being hacked and, and things like that. So um, that, that is something that is, um, I guess, ongoing. Um, and I guess as, as the, the, the industry mature, um, you know, some of these things will, will, will take place. Uh, but before we get there, I think there's a lot of uh, trial and error. Yeah. Uh, in our industry for international trade, and every time when we purchase the goods, we always have to buy insurance for our customer. And that often, you know, is uh, quite uh, tedious because when something happened, and uh, to collect the evidence and uh, to claim for the insurance is a uh, very uh, big tasks. And uh, it's not only you just uh, go, you know, tell the insurance company what's happening. You actually have to prove all of those things and including the right documents from the supplier and always through. So, and what, what we can see is uh, also you, uh, application for the blockchain in the industry, international trade industry can dramatically reduce uh, like probably 90% of the repetition of the documents. I have a customer who actually uh, bought a 20 foot container loads of uh, copperware. It cost them $40,000. And yet when he received the container opened up, it is a uh, 20 lo food uh, loads of uh, sandbag. He was shocked. However, uh, not uh, the worst thing is when we help him to report back to the Chinese policeman, uh, the Chinese policeman said, we're very sorry to hear that. However, we can't help you because we can't go to Australia to collect the evidence says when you open the container, you didn't swap the goods. This is a very sad story, but it's a very true story. However, if we do have the uh, blockchain solution out there and have the technology out there, then this would never happen. But if in any unlikely even it does happen, and this can be solved, you know, you can submit all the information uh, on the blockchain and then to ask for arbitration because all the evidence collected would be, you know, recognized and approved by the legitimate, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, legal entity. And, uh, you know, you can use as the legal evidence. So that's where I see as a great uh, application. Yeah. There's one, um, uh, there are a few uh, improve or uh, efforts happening in the direction at the moment. Um, you know, AIA 
insurance. So they uh, work on a blockchain called R3 Coda in Singapore, where they're redefining their processes, the operations, how they do it. They have created a consortium of um, people involved in international trade, and uh, the whole of the settlement, the policy uh, purchase, everything is done on a blockchain at the moment. Uh, similarly, AIA Malaysia is working with our company, Fintera, to come up with new instrumentization for Takaful uh, insurance. So um, but there are many such efforts which are going around. And uh, so basically, blockchain would change the operations and bring in new instruments in uh, insurance at the moment. We have time for one last question. Do we hands for the one more, one last question? All right, so I will la ask the last questions. Say, okay, um, in summary, and uh, the, um, we have a saying is actually the blockchain and also FinTech are the perfect marriage because of uh, the blockchain is an internet of value. It's one thing the closest to the money. And the fintech is the same. Actually, you know, start from two year 2004, uh, the China People's Bank actually uh, supported the Alibaba, Alipay, and the WeChat uh, for the WeChat Pay. And that actually enabled the peer-to-peer -to -peer -to payment. It's probably one of the most advanced P2P payment. And it's, uh, if, you know, Facebook does issue the Alibaba, does issue the Libra, uh, in my view, China probably would be the only country have that power to contest that. So, uh, FinTech and blockchain, perfect marriage. What happened? What's happily ever after? What do you think the future will be? How will the future would look like? Uh, so my view is that uh, 20 years from now, all finance will be on the blockchain or something like the blockchain. And the blockchain will evolve itself. Thank you. Um, Vitalik Buterin of uh, Ethereum once said, uh, there are only three use cases that he foresee for blockchain. One, digital finance. Number two, uh, potentially identity. And number three, supply chain. These are the only three. Uh, if you can find other use cases, that would be interesting. Uh, but, you know, finance is, is, is the way to go. Yeah. Thank you. Sabrina? Okay. The bank is one of the most conservative area, and they are already accepting the blockchain technologies. And we are also working for the transportation card. The transportation card is uh, the government control it and they are accepting to top up with crypto. It means the government and the, the most conservative banks are already changing to accept the technology. So finally, they will be together. Thank you. Uh, in my view, every technology moves from a disruption phase to a value creation phase. So whether it was FinTech in the early 2000s or blockchain now, we are almost past the disruption phase. We are moving towards uh, more towards the value creation. So that gives us confidence for all of us who are in this uh, space, gives us a confidence that blockchain is here to stay and it will change the fintech landscape for good. So looking ahead, 77% of financial institutions are expect to adopt a blockchain by 2020. This is according to the PwC 27 Global FinTech report. So therefore, doesn't matter, you know, whether bank like it or not, <laughs> the blockchain will go ahead. However, the FinTech will go ahead. So therefore, we, what we do see the future is probably the banking, will banking disappear? Well, in my view, probably not, but it will coexist 
So the perfect, the, the perfect marriage happily ever after is, you know, the banking will adopt some of the technology of uh, the fintech and also the blockchain and will start to revolution themselves and find their fit in this field. And, uh, you know, I already start to see, especially in Australia, like say, for instance, uh, you know, all major four bank and already have the blockchain, uh, the project, the blockchain team, especially one of the leading leading uh, bank was the CBA, and they have already uh, initiated you know, their project and have already applied in some of the applications in their own area. Another uh, one was in China, and China is very leading in this area. So what we can see, the future is very bright. And uh, is there any other comments the panel would like to say? No? Thank you very much. It's a, such a pleasure to have this panel and share the information with you. Thank you so much to all of our pan uh, panelists. And this will be our last panelist right here. Again, thank you guys so, so much. And to all of you who are still here and still going strong, I truly appreciate it. We are done here with day one, right here at Blockonomic Expo 2019. I can't wait to see all of you here again tomorrow. But in the meantime, let us ease our mind and enjoy our tea break session next door. This is a time where you guys can get acquainted and connect with one another. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.